Psalm 104. Psalm 104, we'll begin reading in verse number 24. Psalmist writes, O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping, innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord. You know, I'm terrified to stand behind this pulpit as good as you've been around here, Lord. I just pray that you put a hedge around my mind, a bridle about my tongue, Lord. I pray that uh, you'd anoint these men of God tonight, Lord, that you'd use them. I pray that you'd help your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I've been thinking all week since Brother Sidney preached that message on get out in the deep. There's different kinds of water. There's a lot of deep water, but there's also different kinds of deep water. No introduction tonight. We don't have a title. This is hot off the presses. God will call us out to deep water. Not one, Peter never went back out on that lake, the same deep spot that you know ever again. Now he went out on a few different lakes. He had a few different deep experiences, but never did the same place twice. Now, as I'm thinking, there's a few different types of water. The first kind of deep water is that reinvigorating water. Now I don't know about you. There's a whole bunch of uh, people that got too much money to pay a whole lot of money to go to these places called mineral springs, and there's hot water. What's that water do? Well, it detoxifies you. Gets all the you know, things that aren't good for you out of your skin. But at the same time, it's hot. It relaxes you. It soothes those muscles. And I don't know about you, every now and then, I get a little weary in the spirit. Spirit's indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. I get out in the deep water. God will just rejuvenate me. He'll take all that sin out of me. He'll take all the world off of me. And I get out feeling like I'm you know, ready to charge hell with a gas tank. But there's rejuvenating water, but also there's remodeling water. Mm. See, same thing. There's these pools that you can go to. You look at it and you'd say, that's filthy. I'm not getting in there. But people will get in that water and they'll get in as deep as they can get. And they'll come out coated in mud. Yeah. And that mud has minerals from the, the earth that's good for you. And it'll soak into you. Well, every now and then I get a crack in me. Every now and then I get a piece that's missing from me. The potter will say, come out in the deep water. And he'll reach way down low and grab a handful of mud, rub it all over me, let me dry off, and then he dunks me back in the water. And I don't know about you, I don't think we'll get to heaven and people will say, well, from my ankles down I look a, whole, you know, a little bit like Jesus. I'm not going in neck deep, but Lord, help me. I want to get in all the way. Dunk me all the way in, cover me to where I look more like him. But then also... There's the water of revelation or realization. You want to know how Brother Sidney found out what the word in meant? One day he's out there in the middle of the deep just floating around and a Leviathan came up, breached the water and smacked down. God said, let me teach you what in means. Yeah. You think you know what in? Yeah, in means the opposite of out. Yeah. But he said, no, 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 no. This is what in means. Yeah. This psalmist, Job, any place that you find Leviathan, you want to know why Leviathan doesn't have a name? Nobody knew what it was. They just knew it was big. And every now and then God will say, you may not know what this is, but I'm fixing to show you. Yeah. And you get a glimpse of it. It doesn't stay there very long. Right. But then you go back and you're going to tell everybody that you know about that Leviathan that you saw out there in the water. Yeah. Then finally, there's the water of release. You can go to the Dead Sea. Water's so salty, they tell me it's impossible for you to drown. Yeah. Because no matter what you do, nobody can pull you under. You're going to float. Yeah. You couldn't swim down and touch the bottom if you wanted because you come shooting right back up. Sure. And every now and then, we say, well, Lord, I don't want to go out in the salty water. Or we'll go out and we'll stand in the salty water. I don't see the point in all this. But it's not until you kick your feet back and you just float. Yeah. Yeah. And when you release, you can understand, well, I can't go any lower than his hands. Right. Right. The devil can't pull me down underneath of the surface. Yeah. I couldn't swim under it if I wanted to. Mm. But the joy is in release just letting the water take you where God wants you to go and as I was reading this verse verse number 26 the ships go across the sea every now and then we want the Lord to part the sea every now and then we want to commit our foot to the water and expect it to split we take our mantle off and we smack the river and expect that God's going to part it but God says no 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 you don't go over it you don't go through it you need to get in it 
And just because you got in it once doesn't mean that there's not a different lake or a different pond or a different mud hole that you'd think, well, there's nothing that God can do there. And the next thing you know, there's a Leviathan coming up out of the water just to say, hey, let me show you this for a little bit. Luke chapter number 2, verse 41. Familiar story right here, but let's look at it. Luke 2, verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. When they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the, top, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. When they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. There's a, there's a word that stands out to me in this text, and that's in verse 44. Where, where it said, they supposing him to have been in the company. You know, brother and sister, supposing can get us in a lot of trouble. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, you want to get in trouble with your life, you just go through life on, on a whim, making assumptions, supposing it's going to be a bumpy road for you. Right, right. Now here, I don't have to tell you all this, man. The Lord has been meeting with us around here uh, for a couple weeks now, just meeting with His people, saving people, people getting help, people confessing sins, and God has just been blessing real good. And the most dangerous thing any one of us could do would just go throughout our day to tomorrow or the next day or next week giving no thought to God or the things of God and then we just walk in here and plop down in our seat and just suppose that because He showed up last night and because He showed up the night before that and because He saved some souls the other night that we're just going to plop down in our seat and alright Lord bless me. I know I hadn't thought about you today. Hadn't had any fellowship with you today, but hey, here I am. Bless me, Jesus. Oh, we're going to get in trouble if we get that mindset. God's been good to us around here, but I know this about a move of God. When God's moving, so's the devil. He would love to put out what God is doing right here. So we got to be very careful and very discerning, very sensitive to what God is trying to do. You say, Brother Daniel, we're in the middle of revival. We're meeting with Jesus. Well, they've been with Jesus too. In church. And now they're looking around and He's not there. There's a lack of communication on their part. You say, how do you know, Brother Daniel? Because if at any time on their journey that day, if they would have just turned around and said, Hey, hey, Jesus. Uh, he, he's, not, he's not here. They hadn't been talking with him. Oh, I think sometimes we go longer than a day. Sometimes a week or longer. We don't talk to him. We don't pray. Don't read a Bible. There's a lack of communication. There's a lack of concern. They go a whole day. Now, if you're a parent, any of us, any of I got five kids. I mean, I promise you, there's been a time or two I've lost my kids for a few minutes. Don't look at me like you hadn't, Mom and Daddy. And there's a sense of panic that comes over you when you're in the store and one minute they're there and the next minute they're not. They go a whole day without Jesus. I don't know what was on their minds. I don't know what they were concerned or distracted with, but their thoughts weren't on Jesus. And you could be sitting right here in the middle of this revival meeting while everybody's getting blessed and everybody's getting help and you get nothing because you don't want nothing. Because you're not concerned about it. You're here, but you're more out than you are in. People, people confessing sins and repenting. Nothing moves you. People rejoicing in the Lord and worshiping. Does nothing for you. Nothing stirs you. My soul, what's wrong with you? I mean, God's been real here. Where's your concern? I'm just saying, church, we got to be careful. Be careful that in the middle of this glory and what we're getting to experience, don't start supposing. Don't let your guard down. Don't get lazy. Because just as quick as this thing started, it can be over. If we take for granted what God's doing, I'd say this before I sit down. The Bible says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. If you're here tonight and you're lost, 
It's a good place to meet with Jesus. You can find Him around here. If you'll seek Him, you'll find Him. If you're not careful one day, you're going to go to seeking Him, and you ain't going to find Him. But here you got an opportunity. Well, don't squander it. Don't waste it. Get in while the getting's good. Eh? If you got your Bibles, take them and turn them to Isaiah chapter number 43. Book of Isaiah 43. The Bible says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall ye not know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I got up this morning, I'll be real honest, me and Lindsay got here about 3 o'clock this morning. I was a little tired. I was about half awake sitting there reading my Bible. And God put this portion of Scripture on my heart. And I'll be honest, a lot of times I come to church and I think about what God has done. I think about those past victories. I, I'll be honest, I ate lunch yesterday about 12 o'clock. And you want to know something? When it was supper time or dinner time, however you want to look at it, I was hungry again. I needed something else. And I think we get into a bad place and a bad problem. We come into the house of God and we look and we say, Lord, I appreciate what you did back there. God, I appreciate those victories you gave us back there but we seldom ever look for the new thing and I don't know about you tonight but I drove five and a half hours from Tennessee from a good meeting to find some new things to find God to do something in my heart I believe that we look at the past and we say God I appreciate what you did in those revivals what you did in the 50's in the 60's in the 70's but I just be real honest I want something new tonight I need something fresh in my life I don't know about you but the devil knows my name he knows exactly where I live. He's beat up on me enough. He's worn me out enough. I need something from the King of Glory tonight. I need something from the throne tonight. And you may have walked in here and you as low as you've been all week. You've as tired as you've been all week. Satan's been beating you down. This world's been beating you down. Tonight's a good place to get something new. I don't want to live off past victories. I don't want to live off former things. Look, look at what the verse says in verse number 19 in the latter part. The Bible says, I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We're living in some dark times. We're living in some scary times. You can feel, I remember when all this COVID stuff started and all this stuff began in March. It felt like there was a cloud of darkness come over our country and I just wonder how desperate are we going to get how broken are we going to get how, how, how hungry are we going to get tonight I need something new me and Lindsay ain't got babies but one day Lord willing we will and I don't want them to walk into a dead dry church we need something new tonight Genesis chapter number 22 We'll start with verse number one. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. This is a very familiar passage of scripture. We all know where uh, this leads. Uh, a, a God, uh, the first thing in this chapter that God does is God challenges Abraham. The Bible said that God did tempt or test Abraham. All I want to tell you is if what you have cannot be tested, it cannot be trusted. If you fail, every time a test comes into your life, you ought to check up on what you got. God did test him. He challenged him. Then God did call him. He said the Lord said unto him, Abraham, God comes into his life personally. When God challenges you and sends the test, you can rest assured that God does not leave you to yourself to handle that test. And then God commands him in verse 2. He said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest us get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering. The Lord commands him. It's not a suggestion. We know that Abraham does what he said. Saddles up the animals, takes some servants, goes out to the mountain. God tells him of and he says wait here. Me and the lad are going to go up and worship and on that mountain he binds Isaac. On that mountain he puts the wood in order. He puts Isaac on the altar and he raises the knife and at that very moment 
moment Isaac is not literally dead but in the heart of Abraham and in the eyes of God God sees that Abraham has let go of Isaac and the message is still we need to come and lay our Isaacs on the altar let God look and see that we have laid those Isaacs down we've given them up we've sacrificed them we don't want them anymore but I'm going to preach for three more minutes on this thought what Abraham got after he got, gave up Isaac you hear lay your Isaacs on the altar and he did that but what did Abraham get we get down to verse number 11 or uh, verse number 11 verse 10 he said Abraham stretched forth uh, Abraham stretched forth his hand took the knife to slay his son he laid his Isaac down verse 11 the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven watch this and said Abraham Abraham. First thing Abraham got after he gave up his Isaacs, he got a new relationship. God called him the first time. He said, Abraham, but this time it's personal. It's intimate. He calls him twice to let him know how special you are now. He stepped into a new... Glory to God, I don't know if that's a happy new, but it's a happy me to know you may have to give up something you love. He loved Isaac more than anything in the world, but God said, don't worry worry about it. Abraham Abraham we can see this new relationship in the way God approached him and then he says unto him if you go through it verse 11 he, uh, verse 12 he says lay not thine and neither do thou. I know that thou God seeing thou has not withheld thine only son. We notice now that the relationship is addressed personally that God has has moved in, if you will, right into Abraham. And we notice this relationship by the absence. He never mentions Isaac's name again. I'm glad, thank God, preacher, if you'll come lay it on the altar, if you'll bind it up, if you'll take the knife and cut it off and sacrifice it to God, your family might not let you forget, and your friends might not let you forget, and your foes might not let you forget, but God will never be Bring it up again. Get a brand new relationship. Not only got a brand new relationship, I'm hurrying. He got a brand new revelation. Watch what it said in verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes. Watch this. He lifted up his eyes and looked and behold him a ram. Got a revelation of a ram. You know what a ram is? A ram is a lamb's Father. Well, you know who the Lamb's father is, don't you? When he got Isaac on that altar, God moved into his life. He got a new look at God. He got a new look at the Father. He got a new look, I'm telling you. He got a new revelation. Well, I just don't see God like that. Lay your Isaacs on the altar. Step over here in the deep water and you'll lift up your eyes and you'll get a brand new look at the ram. Got a brand new look at the ram. The ram uh, is the uh, is the lamb's father. He took the ram. Glad, thank God, you can take him. You can get all God you want. He offered him up as a burnt offering in the stead of his son. But this part I want to show you. He looked over there and saw that ram. You know what that ram was? He is stuck. He is stuck, stuck by the horns in the thicket. Now a lot of folk gonna disagree with me here, but I think that ram was stuck in the horns for Abraham, stuck by the horns for Abraham ever loaded up the animals. Before he ever gathered up the wood. That ram was stuck in that thicket. You say, I don't believe that preacher. Why didn't he see it? He still had Isaac in the way. Yeah. But as soon as he laid that Isaac down, yeah. he noticed that ram. How, what makes you think he had been hung in there all, he was there the whole time. It wasn't like he just showed up. I'll tell you why. Because this Bible said uh, that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God uh, slain before the foundation of the world. Before there's ever a sinner. Before Adam ever failed. Jesus was the Lamb 
Lamb of God. Jesus was the Savior. Jesus was the sacrifice. Jesus was the blood sacrifice. He was the burnt offering. He's always been there. Abraham just couldn't see him because Isaac was in his way. Oh, I ain't never seen Jesus like that. Get ready, Isaac. Saw the ram, the lamb's father. Got a new got a new relationship, got a new revelation. I'll give you this, I'm finished. He got a new realization. He called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. Basically means the Lord will see to it. The Lord, let me put it in old Weaver Weaverology here. The Weaver common, country commentary of this text says the Lord will take care of him. And what Abraham said is if God can put a ram in a thicket and God can spare my son. See, now let me just point out, I believe that Abraham believed that he could kill his boy, burn him to ashes, and God could raise him back. God never had raised anybody from the dead. Don't think Abraham didn't have faith. He not only believed God could do the impossible, he believed God could do something that nobody ever even thought of before. He can do exceeding, abundantly, above all we can ask or think. He said he's Jehovah, Jireh. I'm gonna just go ahead and tell you this and I'm finished. If God could find me on a mill hill, he could pay my sin debt, wash my sins away, put me in a right standing before a thrice holy God, prepare me a place in heaven, come and get me and walk with me and talk with me and make sure that when I die, I'm not going to go to hell where I deserve. I just believe come what may, let hell roll in like a flood, let the devil roar like a lion, let problems fall like the snow I just believe if God can take care of all that he'll take care of whatever is in your life just lay your Isaac down this is what you get Jehovah Jireh Job chapter number 2 we're just going to read one verse real quick verse number 8 said he took a potsherd to scrape himself with fall and he sat down among the ashes can I say, our pastor talked about even that during prayer, if you were here early for prayer, about people all week, God's met with us, God's been good to us, but there's still some that just don't seem like they've got in. Why? Why not? You're sitting in your ashes. And what I want to preach is this thought real quick. You can get up out of your ashes. It starts with the willingness. The willingness, number one, is you have to be willing to set in the ashes. Well, what do you mean set in the ashes? Caitlin sings that song, Blessings. Our yeah. blessings come from raindrops. Right. Well, we would know because we try to dodge them too often. There's too many times God might put something in our life because he wants to teach us something, he wants to show us something, and we live in a fantasy world thinking nothing should ever happen to us. We walk around, we try to dodge it. I'm convinced, Brother Greg, if we was the three Hebrew boys, every time they try to get that furnace hotter, we'd have turned around and said, we're going to serve God, and we'd have tried to throw a bucket of ice in there. We'd have tried to cool it off instead of just dealing with whatever it is that God's given us. First, you've got to be willing to set in your ashes. The second thing you've got to be willing to do is you've got to be willing to share in your ashes. We understand what his friends did once they opened their mouth. But what does it say in verse number 11? Now when Job's three friends heard all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, and Bildad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the Napathite. For they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Brother Jordan's devotion, even Wednesday, talked about, yes, we have our rock, but we also have a relationship with people that can help be a light in our life. God puts people that we can share things with, that we can go to when we're dealing with things, that we can have those people that can just help lift us up, get us through those times. But too many times we're not willing to share it. We have that ego, but we have that pride problem. I can deal with this. I'll deal with it all on my own. And the last thing, if we're going to get up out of our ashes, then you got to stand up out of your ashes. See, too many times I loved it. I loved Winnie the Pooh. I loved watching it. I loved, but too many times we're like Eeyore. 
Yeah. We walk around all the time, woe is me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. Look, Job faced a whole lot after chapter 2 all the way to verse number 42, or chapter 42, but in chapter 42 and verse 12, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning, for at 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she asses. We know where he ends up. Sure. Well, how did he get there? Because he was willing to get up out of his ashes. See, too many times we said and we wallow in everything we talked about. We've seen everything that God's done here two weeks ago and this week, and we still have some that we're just sitting around wallowing in whatever it is that God's put in our way. Whatever that may, may be different for each and every one. You can look and you can get all kinds of opinions on what ashes that Job set down in. Whatever your ashes are tonight, get up out of them. Psalms 23, the Bible said in verse number 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I like these next four words. I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We see in verse number 1, the Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, can I say we can be satisfied with God? There's a lot of people trying to satisfy their lives with things and money. But I'm glad tonight I don't need those things. I don't need a new truck. I don't need a big house. The only thing I need in my life is God. We can see we can be satisfied, verse number 1. Verse number 3 tells us we can be strengthened. The Bible says He restoreth my soul. That word restore means to bring back to life. Dads in old cars. And man, you watch those TV shows. And man, you take that, they look at that rust bucket out in the woods, Brother Jordan. I'm like, man, how in the world, preacher, is something going to become of that? How in the world, Brother Sidney, is something going to become of that rust bucket that's got, that's got holes all in it and nothing's ever going to come? But you give that man a few months later, Brother James, and out of nowhere, that thing that used to be a rust bucket, that thing that used to not be nothing for nobody, nobody could ride in, nobody could enjoy, nobody could, man, get in that thing and drive down the road and now it's a brand new thing because it got restored let me say this I'm glad sometimes in my life where spiritually I have a flat tire spiritually I have an axle rod to break spiritually things happen in my life I'm glad we have a God that restores us not only can we be satisfied we can be strengthened but I want you to draw your attention to verse number 4 the Bible says yea though I walk through uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wish I could tell you there would never be no trouble. I wish I could tell you tonight there would never be a trial or all because God's moving. That doesn't mean valleys are going to happen. One thing I've learned in my life, the closer I get to God, the closer the devil gets to me. And man, it seems like, man, you can go through. Man, we're sunshine and things are looking good. Then all of a sudden, a phone call will turn your night to today into night. That phone call turns you upside down. And man, you're in the valley. Man, and we, we could preach there all day long, but I want to notice what that word says. Yea, though I walk through. Can I say, though we are in the valley, I'm glad weeping may endure for a night, but I'm glad joy comes in the morning. Those valleys, the Bible specifically says, Yea, though I walk through. Where did they walk through? The Bible says this, the valley of the shadow of death. They say that shepherd would take those sheep through the valley of the shadow of death. There was, man, the, the sun was going down and on the side of the mountaintop, preacher, those sheep would go along with the shepherd because they trust the shepherd. And man, as the dark and darkness comes down and, and the shade, Brother Sidney, comes down, man, those coyotes and those werewolves and those bears, man, man, were in the shadows. Man, though they were in the shadows hiding. The sheep couldn't see what's in the shadows, but, but what was in the shadows could see the sheep. And no doubt there's been many of a dry bones of other sheep on that valley of the shadow of death. Brother Christian, there's been many. Them sheep look down, see the ankle bone or the head bone of another sheep. But man, them sheep, man, just keep following the shepherd. Can I say, man, those sheep cannot see the fear that's lying in the outside, that's lying in the dark. Those sheep don't care about the coyotes. Those sheep don't care about the werewolves and the big old grizzly bears. You know why those sheep? Sheep don't care because
Because they got a shepherd that's leading them. Can I remind you tonight, no matter what's going on in our lives, the unknown, we don't know what's going on. Fear has struck our hearts. Them boys at work asked me the other day, they said, Brother Sidney, why, why, why ain't this stuff bothering you? i tell you why it's not bothering me. i got a good God in glory that knows everything that's going on. I'm glad I have a good shepherd. He's a leading the way. And I don't have to worry what's going on. The other day, Parker come to the house and dad was up here man sitting in the glory and Parker come come to the house the other day Parker come busting through the doors he's all about to be seven years old a big old boy it was dark time and brother Ray he come busting through there and he just a huffing and a puffing like I am right now scared to death I said boy what in the world is wrong with you What's going on? My mama needed something and he just ran brother Doug he come in there and said Oscar is after me I said, hold up now. We ain't got no farm out here. We don't have no ostriches out here. Yeah. He said, Jeff, you don't, there's, Oscar is out there. I said, dear Lord, boy, what in the world? And I would laugh at him, make fun of him. But the truth of the matter is, I'm scared of the dark too. Say amen. <laughs> Brother Doug, I looked at that little boy. I said, what do you mean? He said, Daddy, said if I walked outside at nighttime all by myself, Oscar's going to get me. And son, it swelled in my heart, Brother Sidney. He's afraid of the unknown. I was just about to laugh at that little boy. And the Holy Ghost of God spoke to my heart. He said, Jeffrey, you may laugh all you want to, but there's some Oscars in your life. There's some Oscars that are hiding out in your closet. There's some things that you're scared of, sir, that you're wife has no idea. Can I say your husband may not know. Your preacher may not know. And preacher about that time that little boy was scared to death. Brother Sidney I looked at him I said let me tell you one thing. I said Oscar may try to get you but there's one person he don't want to mess with. There's a 300 pound 6 foot 4 uncle and a papa and some people that's going to knock Oscar's head off. And can I say when Oscar comes to me Brother Sidney I'm glad I can tell him Oscar you may come at me you may mess up my mind I may lose some sleep I may lose some peace but dear God you don't want to mess with my daddy can I say I'm glad I have a God in the midst of the unknown in the midst of the fear I'm glad I have a God to take care of the valley of the shadow Jeremiah chapter 20 verse number 9 then I said I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart. Yep. as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Here we find the great prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah preached some 40 years, and we have no evidence in Scripture he ever had one convert. He's known as the weeping prophet. He's also the author of Lamentations. A book of weeping when what he had preached for 40 years became uh, evident and real in Israel's life. It came to pass and they went into bondage because they would not hear the preacher. Tonight some of you are in bondage because you haven't been listening to the preachers. Some of you tonight are headed to hell because you're not listening to the preachers. Some of you have no victory and no joy because you haven't listened to what thus saith the Lord. But let me share something with you here about Jeremiah, this great man of God, this man that in God's eyes, even though he never had a convert, was ultimately successful because he did exactly what God called him to do. Uh, my dear friend, uh, uh, fruit uh, is measured by a lot of independent Baptist preachers. Uh, how many folks they get confessing Christ? Uh, how many they can say were saved in this meeting uh, and saved in that meeting? Uh, how many they can say they run? Uh, how many buses they own? Uh, how much money they got in the bank? Uh, I got news for you. They doesn't impress God. Uh, God flung the stars out on nothing. Uh, he flung the sun out there and told it when to shine. Uh, he called all the stars by name. Uh, God took nothing and made everything. Uh, hey, there's nothing you got to offer God that impress Him. Uh, can I help you with something? Fruits of God. 
Without Him, we can do nothing. He's the one that gives the increase. He just tells us what to do. And when we're obedient, we're ultimately successful in God's eyes. But just like Brother Jeffrey said about Oscar, just like Brother Josh said about the ash pile, just like Brother Jordan talked about sometimes that ankle deep, just like Brother Sidney talked about uh, uh, having an Isaac in your way. Listen, Brother John, we said we, we rely on them past blessings. We don't have any victory because we get our eyes off of what God told us to do. Jeremiah is in that space in chapter number 20. Can I say Jeremiah is discouraged? He's been preaching almost 18 years. And he really thinks by 18 years Israel will repent. Hmm? Can I help you with something? Every young preacher thinks that they're the next great thing. Hmm? Everybody's surely wanting to come to hear what I got to say. Uh, I've got the key. I've got the answer. Uh, I know what uh, is going on. Uh, I, I, I'm ready to part the Red Sea. Just come and listen to me. Hmm? And after a few storms, and after they realize they're not all that, and God knocks the props out from under them a couple of times. Then they're about ready for God to use. Jeremiah thought he'd have won Israel by now. Even though in chapter number one, God tells Jeremiah, I've made you an iron pillar, a defense city. He says, you're going to a stiff neck, uncircumcised heart of people. They're not going to hear you, but preach it anyway. He quit listening to God and he got discouraged. As good as God's been around here, some of you are discouraged tonight. Can I say? He, got de de he felt deceived. Look at verse 7. Look what he says. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. God didn't deceive him. Hmm? You know what deceived him? His own ego. Hmm? He's feeling deceived. Uh, he's discouraged. Uh, he's in derision. Uh, uh, verse number 8 says, uh, For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence uh, and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. He's in derision. When he got to call of God, he had zeal, but now the burden of preaching the word of God is wearing on him. Remember when you first got saved? how excited you was, how joyful you was, how you wanted to tell everybody how you couldn't wait to come to church, uh, how you couldn't wait to hear the singing, uh, how you couldn't wait to hear the preaching, uh, how uh, uh, Jesus was just so fresh to you. Uh, all you knew was the love of God and you couldn't get enough of it. What's happened to you? Where's your shout? Where's your joy? Where's your excitement? Some of you look like yesterday's leftovers. You're in derision. Can I say something else about him? In verse number 9, he said, I'll not make mention of him nor speak his name anymore. Can I say this? He's defeated. Let me ask you something. How many of you God's been good to? And yet, so many days you live your life in defeat. Oh, my. Do you realize we've been promised victory in Christ? Sure. We've been made more than kings and priests in yeah. Him. But we walk around like the base and the lowest uh, off scour of the earth. We walk around without joy, without hope, without excitement. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. God's been blessing around here and I watched some of you walk in here tonight and you was defeated. And then Jeremiah said, I'm not going to speak his name anymore. Jeremiah was done. Some of you are coming, but you're done. You've quit in your heart. Jeremiah threw in the towel. what he did I'm done 
Some of you have quit on revival. The other night, Zachary played, Lord, don't let it in. Don't let it in. But some of you are saying, boy, I hope it's over. You've quit. You haven't been spent time with God today asking God to show up and do it again. You've quit. Young people are singing and you're just sitting there. You do realize about six or seven of them have been snatched from the claws of hell, don't you? Just in the last couple of weeks. You do realize uh, 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 those are all answers to prayer. We got a whole garden out there. It's a testimony when we didn't have kids, but now we do. Hey, have you heard some of these kids testify? Have you heard some of these kids uh, 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 sing about Jesus? Uh, have you seen some of them broken in the altar and you're sitting there and you're done? You've thrown in the towel. It's because you don't realize what's in the towel. It's just a towel. The Word of God's in that towel. That's what's in that towel. I mean, let's let the crossroads and the feel goods and the window washers, let's just let them have it all. Let's, let's just let them print all the NIVs and NLTs and ESVs and the BBDs and all that. It don't matter. You've thrown in a towel. It don't matter that the Word of God gets printed and published. It don't matter. Uh, uh, you've quit. It don't matter. Can I say your Baptist distinctives are in that towel? Yeah. We're to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Do you realize the very thing that we preach around here and stand on is the very thing that Jesus gave to his disciples uh, and told them to take it to the world? Uh, uh, we're not talking about what the Pope has to say. Uh, uh, we're not talking about uh, uh, what the water dog uh, Church of Christ have to say. Uh, we're not talking about uh, 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 the uh, uh, chicken dancing, uh, tongue speaking Church of God folks and what they say. Uh, uh, we're talking about what Jesus said. Uh, hey, we're talking about true Baptist Distinctives, uh, things that men and women have died at the stake over, uh, uh, things that people were burned over, uh, things that people were stoned over, uh, uh, things that are worth dying for. But what do you care? They're in the towel. You don't care. You've thrown it away. Let's let's just let's just let a, 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 the whole ecumenical crowd have it. Hmm. Let's just take the shingle off of, of the sign anyway. It don't matter. Yeah. Oh, everybody's going to heaven. You see, you don't know what's in the towel. You've thrown it away. Emmanuel Baptist Church is in the towel. You still praying about the building program? Look around. We're going to build it. We're going to burn it down, one or the other. What are we going to do? You're thrown in the towel. We don't need a we don't need the church. Let's just sell it. Let's let them bulldoze it. Turn it into condos, huh? You do why do you care? You've thrown it in. Hmm? It don't matter. Hmm? You're thrown in the towel. You know what's in the towel? The blood of Jesus Christ. The feel-good crowd says that we're saved by his death. Oh. Well, if that's the case, why didn't he have a heart attack? Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Uh, hey, my dear friends, uh, if you're not blood washed, you're not going to heaven. Uh, Jesus died and shed his blood uh, to redeem us from our wicked sin. But see, you, you've thrown it away. And by doing so, you're trampling his blood under your feet. You're thumbing your nose at Almighty God. Because that don't mean anything. It's just the blood of Christ. It's just the very thing that's on the mercy seat right in front of the throne of God tonight. It is the very thing that is securing 
our heaven for us. But what do you care? It don't matter. It's just the blood of Christ. You know what's in that towel that you just threw away? All these precious kids. They're in that towel. Let's make it a little more personal. You know what's in that towel you just threw away, Miss Melissa? Zach, Sarah, your grandbabies. They're in that towel. Hmm? Justin's in that towel. Hmm? It's in that towel. Your children, your older children, they're in that towel. You've just thrown them away. Let them die and go to hell. Because God, you deceived me. Oh God, I don't want to go on in revival anymore. It doesn't matter. Your children. Hear that towel. That new grandbaby you just got. She's in that towel. You just threw it away. Hmm? Your boy in that towel. He's in that towel. Her husband, her boy, is in that towel. Brother Bob, Clinton Amy's in that towel. Your sisters are in that towel. Eddie, Courtney's in that towel. Cinda, your son's in that towel. Brandon and Courtney's in that towel. Rod Kelsey's in this towel. Clint Trent's in that towel. Robin's in that towel. Caleb, your cousins are in that towel. Hmm? Titus is in that towel. Raymond's in that towel. Them grandbabies are in that towel. That grandbaby you held on Father's Day is in that towel. Jake's in that towel. Your boy's in that towel. Hmm? Your brother's in that towel. Your little sisters are in that towel. That's right, Pete. You see, is in that towel. Your family's in that towel. They're in that towel. Hmm? They're in that towel. Sydney, that grandbaby of yours is in that towel. Your daughter's in that towel. Kevin, your family's in that towel. You've thrown in the towel. Jeremiah said, but his word was a fire shut up in my bones and I could not stay. See, Jeremiah threw in the towel, but he did get his towel back. Listen. I learned a long time ago, instead of throwing it down, throw it up. Signal to heaven, I need help! God, I'm about to throw her in. I need some help. <laughs> throw it up. Yeah. If the Lord lets me, I'll tell you where I got this message. But right now, folks are coming and getting their towels. Some of you need to come get a towel. Here they are. Just come get them. Come get your towel back. You've done quit. You've said it's too hard going to church this much. Man, God's asking too much of me. They're not paying attention. I keep inviting them. They're not coming. I just want to quit. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Some of you just need to come get some towels. Get your towel back. Don't let the devil have your children, your grandchildren. Don't let the devil rob you of your joy. Hey, don't let the promises of God and the things of God become none effect. Some of you need to get your towel back. You've done quit. You've done quit. Well, there's towels all up here. Some of you need to come get some. 
You might be here tonight and you might not have a towel. You might be here unsaved, lost on your way to hell. If you care about your soul at all, you ought to come. Let somebody take a Bible and introduce you to Jesus. Some of you, you you've done lost sight of what this thing's really about. It's about souls. It's about the will of God. It's about the commandments of God and the things of God. Some of you have done quit. You've done give up. You've had enough. Some of you just need to come get your towels. Some of you need to come get that burden back. Some of you need to come and tell God you're sorry because you've been blaming Him instead of blessing Him. Some of you just need to do business with God tonight. Trust me, I would, I'd much rather heard all these men of God preach, but I'd rather obey God than anything. And some of you have lost your towels. Brother Daniel, come to the piano and play something. Let's all stand. People are doing business with God. Some of them getting their towels back. How about you tonight? You willing to come? Get your towel back? Come? Ask God to help you? Come? Tell God you're sorry? Are you tired of going through the motions? Some of you have been every night meeting for two weeks and you still haven't got any brokenness. No rejoicing, no nothing. You need your towel back. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.